Today we continue our exploration of the temple that once stood in Jerusalem, its significance and its destruction, and what took place after its destruction. Shalom, my friends. This is Akiva Gersh with Israel in 5, where we give you everything Israel in 5 minutes. Please like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or want to keep the conversation going, please do so below in the comments. Last week, we learned about the historical and spiritual uh, spiritual significance of the temple that stood twice, two different times in Jerusalem, each time over 400 years, and how the temple served as a central and vital and most important spiritual place for the ancient Israelites, right, the ancient Jewish people, a place where they prayed, a, pr a place where they brought sacrifices, a place where they connected to God, a home for God in this world, uh, so to speak, a place that was all about and meant to bring the presence of God into this physical world. And we learned about its destruction. We know that the temple got destroyed twice, first by the Babylonians, later on, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. Let's go to the destruction by the Babylonians, the first temple uh, being destroyed, excuse me, by the Babylonians, and what took place afterwards? Because what took place upon the destruction of the first temple was an absolute national and spiritual crisis. For the first time ever, the Israelite people did not have a central place of worship. All throughout the years of the desert, they had a tabernacle. For hundreds of years, uh, after coming into the land of Israel, they had the tabernacle. After that, the temple was built, and they had the temple. They had the place where they, where they worshipped God, where they served God, where they connected to God, where they felt God. And now, all of a sudden, in the 6th century BCE, the temple was destroyed, and for the first time in about 1,000 years, the Israelites needed to deal with the fact that they don't have a temple anymore. And on top of that, they were kicked out of their home. They were kicked out of their land. They were exiled into Babylonia. The biggest question of that time was, how are they going to survive? What are they going to do? What's going to be next? Are we going to survive? If we look at it rationally, there's every reason in the book for the Israelite nation to come to an end. They were disconnected from their land. Don't forget that before that, the 10 tribes of Israel were also exiled by the Assyrians, the, the, the 10 northern tribes. So now you have pretty much the entire nation in, in exile, disconnected from its land. Right? The last remnant disconnected. Right? For the first time, the entire uh, nation disconnected. They're living in a foreign land, a foreign culture, foreign traditions, foreign religion, foreign language. How are they going to make this work? How are they going to continue being Jews in a foreign land? when what was so essential and central to being a Jew was the temple itself. That was the biggest question of the day. There were two prophets who helped the, the Israelites, the Jews of that generation. One was Jeremiah, who told them, you're in your new land, settle into your new land, build homes, plant trees, plant crops, right? be there, because that's where you're going to be. This is a punishment. I told you so. Right? He and other prophets warned them. But now you're here. Now it happened. Be there and make the best out of it. But he also told them, don't worry, you're going to return in 70 years. He gave them that future knowledge that this is not going to be forever. That yes, you are exiled. This is a punishment for what you did. But don't worry, it's not going to last forever. You are going to have the opportunity to go home. That's a tremendous thing for the nation to hear at this time of such a spiritual crisis. In addition, the prophet Ezekiel, the only prophet to prophesize outside the land of Israel, also is there. And having incredible prophecies and also as his, what we consider one of his most famous prophecies. In chapter 37 of the book of Ezekiel, the prophecy of the Valley of the Dry Bones, which is one incredible, vivid uh, story of, of the, these visions he had, which were all about giving hope, sending the message of hope to the Israelite people. You might look like you're down and out. You might look like you're a bunch of dry bones scattered around the dry valley, but don't worry, you're going to come back to life and you're going to return home. An incredible message of faith, belief, and hope for the nation to hear. Now, that was in the spiritual realm. But on the everyday practical realm, the Jews still needed to figure out, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? We can't go to Jerusalem. We're not doing sacrifices anymore, right? The sacrifices only were allowed to be done in Jerusalem in the temple. What are they going to do? So this was a time of incredible change and innovation in the Jewish uh, religion. Right? The leaders of the generation, the leaders of that day who were there in Babylonia with him decided that we need to do things new. We need to do things different. We need to create new things, new systems, new ways, new practices 
in order to replace what we what we had and now what we lost. And in place of the temple, not that the, the, the temple could ever be replaced, but for the first time ever, synagogues will appear in Jewish practice and in Jewish history. We didn't have synagogues before. It was only the temple and then personal prayer wherever you were. They built synagogues as almost like a small replica of the temple, a place for people to come together, to gather, to feel connected and to pray, right? to feel connected to each other and to feel connected to God. So synagogues came into play, all right? A new kind of realm of teachers came into play. Instead of the Kohanim, the priests, being the one to lead the generation, they were the ones who did the work in the temple. It was now uh, the, the sofer, the sofrim, as we say in Hebrew, which were the scribes. They're the ones copying the Torah, and they're the ones who know the Torah very well, and they become the, the leading teachers, right? Because the priests don't have what to do right now. There's no temple, no sacrifices. And the scribes become the, the, the main leaders and the main teachers of the day. And the third thing that they do, the third thing that they do is they start to develop prayer, right? Formalized individual community prayer, which the Jewish people did not have before. Now we have prayer books, it's all organized. They, we, we know what to say, what part of the day, what part of the service. Back then, there was no such thing. There was no need for such a thing. And now that there's no temple, and now that there's a synagogue, so the prayers will begin to get developed. It took many hundreds of years for them to fully get um, compiled and formalized, but the process will begin in the exile in Babylonia, right? because the leaders know that we need, we need something to replace uh, what we once had, right? where we had the temple, we had now have the synagogue, where we had the priests, now we have the, the scribes, and where we had sacrifices, now we have prayers. Right? And these were the, these new innovations that literally saved the Jewish people. Right? Jeremiah and, Ez and Ezekiel saved them spiritually, and these innovations, these changes, these new additions to Jewish life saved them religiously, saved them practically, right? to give them something to hold on to and something to to have in place of what they once had, what they lost. And even after the Jews leave the Babylonian exile, they will take these things back with them. And we'll explore that next week. All the best and be well.